segue into the next because our first presentation for today was on Quality Matters, which is peer review of design of online courses. And then we talked about um, peer review of presentation or delivery in the second session. And then, um, and, and of course, peer review um, involves feedback. And then this session is about getting feedback from students. So it all fits into this teaching smarter category. And um, the topic that I'm presenting today came from um, the College of Ed's discussions of um, our unhappiness with the IDEA survey, primarily students, um, you know, not very many people filling it out, and also timeliness of getting the results. Um, so what we did is we um, we actually had Dr. Who present at one of our all college meetings um, because he um, was really satisfied with a few ways that he came up with for formative assessment, getting feedback from students throughout the semester. Um, in order to be able to improve and enhance his teaching um, and therefore obviously um, help students learn. So I'm going to share with you a few of the things that he does in his class and classes and also see what kinds of things you do and um, so do a little bit of brainstorming together. Um, there, have, there has been a kind of a, a lot of press about those end of semester surveys being not very useful because, you know, if a student thought it was too much work or they didn't get a good grade, then they might give a bad evaluation. Um, whereas these uh, low stakes formative um, assessments throughout the semester can really, um, can really help you make some changes before things might go wrong for students. Um, so, the other thing that I wanted to mention is this is, of course, going to vary. We're lucky in the College of Ed that many of our classes are, are on the smaller side. And um, there are, are probably um, some faculty out there that teach very, very large classes, and it would be really hard to maybe implement some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, and there's just so many things to consider. Um, and things like the timing, you know, that's the what we're talking about here is doing things during the semester. Um, but still, do you want to do something like immediately after a class or assignment? Do you want to get some feedback? Or, you know, waiting until like midterm and, and having them kind of think about the whole semester so far? Um, and then also, how do you want to deliver this, um, the questions? Do you want to have the students write, which is the most common? Um, but it also could be done in, in a discussion. Um, and then if you do have it written, did you want it to be anonymous or identified, and what difference does that make? Um, and as I already said, the class size will also determine how you can do it. So what we're going to talk about is why to do it, then when, and what to ask, and then maybe some ideas for what tools to use, so how to um, get that feedback. So that's our plan for today. Um, David, thanks for joining us. Um, Sue Hines and I are both from the College of Education. Um, would you grab the mic and just give a quick introduction, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. David Morrison. Uh, I teach in Computer Networking Technology Program here over at the University Center. Oh, I think I know who you are, I just realized. <laughs> it took me a while to remember you from back when I worked over there at CTC and CIOS. Um, but anyway, so um, what we're going to do today, as I said, you may have missed David, that um, that Dr. Who couldn't be with us today, but, but he and I work together and I'm sharing some of his uh, great ideas. So basically, uh, what we're going to start with is just talking about some of the benefits of, of asking students for feedback throughout the semester instead of waiting until the end. and. Um, one of the one of the things that um, you know is obvious is that you can you know make some changes before it's too late to um, affect the students. But um, another one, because as I said, this kind of all started with us talking about our uh, that we weren't very happy with the IDEA course evaluation. Um, what has has happened, at least in Dr. Who's classes, is that by asking the students for a lot of feedback and by being really good about following up with them, and, you know, reading what they wrote in a timely manner and following up, that it actually has 
kind of fostered a feeling among the students that he cares about their teaching. And so in the end, it actually increased IDEA rates, which um, I thought was a, you know, a great result. But, um, but anyway, kind of interesting. So can you guys, I'm going to let you um, grab the mic. Can you think of some other um, benefits of getting feedback from students? Well, I think you covered them, you know, to kind of keep you on point if something needs to be changed. But I think sometimes that um, if the feedback, you know, it's, it's a good way to keep the class feedback. I mean, if you're kind of reporting, oh, I heard this and this and this, and I really appreciate this, you know, everybody kind of feels a little bit more positive about your connection with them as students. And I think that's what we all need to work with um, when we're online. I just feel like there's that gap if we don't do something intentional. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine, I mean, I don't have data or anything, but that it wouldn't just improve the idea results, but they would be more likely to be more engaged throughout class and to get more out of class because they know you care and more likely to participate and actually bring up things and talk because they know you actually care. I think I kind of, this semester, I teach the same course, but sometimes it's online, sometimes it's on campus, you know. And I kind of know that I'm going to cover the same material, but I really can do it in many different ways. And when the, when the students give me feedback, I, I like to be able to adjust exactly how I'm going to do that. And it seems like they feel like they had a lot more ownership. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, and I was talking to you, Sue, about um, the fact that this particular group of students you have seem to really like the online discussion boards and blackboards, the, the asynchronous part of it. And I have had that same experience, too, where some classes seem to really go for that and others really don't like it. And so, you know, sometimes you don't even have to ask for feedback. <laughs> you can tell by their participation. <laughs> um, but another situation that I'll share is I remember when I first started um, teaching and I um, was, I found out a little too late that one of my students didn't know that he could go to my grades and read my feedback. And so I, it was a communications issue, really. Um, and um, maybe if I had asked some, some better questions earlier in the semester, I would have found out a little sooner. Because that was, to me, that was a major deal because I, I've always learned that in teaching online, you know, giving students a lot of feedback, particularly at the beginning of the semester on what they've turned in, is, is really, really important. And um, also doing that in a timely manner. And, um, and you know, me kind of making the assumption that this student didn't really care because he wasn't, you know, doing any of the things that I suggested, finding out that it was a miscommunication. And so I think it can help in that way as well. So one, one other thing that um, Dr. Hu and I, in, we, we worked together on a, on a course called um, Educational Technology, where, where our students, um, our elementary students, learn about integrating technology. But one of the things that we cover in that class is, um, is universal design and um, accessibility. And we have the students watch. Um, these videos that are really, really amazing. They're, they're from students with disabilities, and basically they're in the videos they're asking. I just put the link in chat if you want to look at it later. Um, and they're just short videos of uh, college students with disabilities saying, you know, what their instructors could do to improve their learning. And some of them are, you know, just really simple, easy things that, you know, an instructor probably wouldn't take too much, wouldn't take them too much time to implement something, but, um, you know, do they ask, do they know this information while well, there's still time to, to make those changes? So, um, I'll just mention that if you want to take a look at it. It's called From, From Where I Sit. Do you, I know before when I had a, face-to-face uh, -face cl class, I knew when I had someone with disabilities, but do is it only up to the students? I mean, I did have a deaf student once. 
and then um, the learning disability, but is it only if the students uh, do that, uh, tell you that you know that, or is there some kind of communication from their enrollment? Well, the, the student actually does have to, I, I believe, I don't know if I'm using the right word, register with DSS, and then DSS will, would give you a notification, um, but a student with a disability um, I don't believe it's automatically registered with DSS. I believe they have to go there. At least that's the way it used to be. Um, do you know, David? Yeah, they do have to go register with DSS because DSS is the one who has to make the actual determination of what services they need provided. Um, I mean, we're not even supposed to do that. I mean, we shouldn't. If a student comes to us, we're saying, well, you have to go to DSS because they're the ones that are qualified to make that kind of an assessment of exactly what they need and that that's proven. And so then they can then then they do. They send emails to any teachers that get them in their class and say, hey, you have this student in your class. This is the accommodations you need to provide to them. Um, so that way you're not in a situation where you're trying to assess what they need. Right. And just to go back to the. Um the universal design is a little different. It's kind of a, a, a you know, instead of having instead of having to make accommodations to try to design things universally so that there won't be any barriers to begin with, so that you won't have to then make accommodations. I mean, you might not be able to, but but that's the idea behind universal design. So, um, in looking at those from where I sit videos, um, they talk about uh, or or something we could talk about. I guess I should say is when a student offers a suggestion like, you know, it would really help me if you could post some lecture notes or outline or something prior to class, um, that, that would undoubtedly help all of the students, not just that one student. So um, that's just one example. And then the other thing, um, Sue, that you made me think of was just that you also have students with some different um, some different uh, learning styles, and also um, just um, learning differences. I had, I actually had a student when I taught um, at another campus um, who was was mute, um, but she was an elective, if that's the right word, mute. In other words, she could physically talk, but she did not talk, um, which was quite a challenge. And I, and DSS, when I spoke to them, you know, they couldn't. I mean, they couldn't give me any specifics, but they did definitely help me come up with some possibilities for working with that student in an online class, which was challenging. That's a good reminder because I don't think I've been asking online or even probing to say, you know, if there's something I can do to help. So thanks. Uh, that's, I mean, not on this topic, but very helpful. So that brings us right to um, some different ideas. And one of the things that I learned from Dr. Who um, is about the class review. And one of the things that he learned from me was the midterm course evaluation. Um, and the midterm course evaluation is a little more formal, um, being that it's, it's an anonymous survey um, in, in using Blackboard surveys, which um, whenever I first learned to teach online, um, it was more of a technical piece, you know, being when when distance learning was new to, you know, make sure that people were getting everything they needed and, and that kind of thing. So, um, but the class review is really an incredible tool where something like that, Sue, would, would come naturally out without you having to specifically ask because the way Doctor Who runs a class review, is we meet um, every week online and collaborate, uh, just once a week. And every midnight of the day, so if we, we meet on Wednesdays this semester, and by, min, by midnight, every Wednesday, a class review is due. And basically, he asks the students, um, and I'll just switch over to the, the slide while I'm talking about it. He, he asked the students these two questions. What have you learned from today's class, and what things do you want to clarify? So it's kind of like a um, clearest, muddiest point um, in, in different words. And it's not, he's not asking them for too long. But what I find incredible about this is that 
I know because I co-teach with him that he he reads them right away. So he has them do that midnight, and then he reads them the next day, and he acts on them, which is, of course, the most important thing. Because sometimes there'll be questions that are related to the part of the class that I do, which is more of the technology, uh, integrating the technology piece. And so I know that he um, reacts. And even when we had a class where we gave them some class time, for example, to work on um, a project. Um, one of the students really didn't like that. And so when we actually had the same thing planned a few weeks later with a different um, tool, he changed it immediately and, and said, you know, it's your choice. You can use this time in class um, to work on it. Or if you find that, you know, you would rather do it on your own time or whatever. So my point is that he he definitely follows up on what the students say in the in the class review. So um, what do you guys think about that idea? Would it be um, possible even in, in any of your classes due to class size or, or anything else? I don't know, probably. What were the two questions he would, he asked again? The, um, the, you should be seeing those right on the on the whiteboard. What what have you learned from today's class? Sorry, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, they're <laughs> up there. Well, I'm confusing myself because I actually have PowerPoint open and Collaborate. I'm looking at two different slides, so I thought maybe I had it wrong, but yeah. So these are the two things which, um, you know, classic education, they call it clearest, muddiest point. And that's a very common thing to ask, but this is just in a different way, saying the same thing. So are you saying you have class on Wednesday, and then he wants this response by midnight of that same day, and then he would not do something with it until the next Wednesday? No, I'm saying, well, it depends on what it is. <laughs> I'm saying that he... You're right about the first thing. We have class Wednesday. It's due by midnight. He reads it the next day. So Thursday, he reads it. Depends on what it is, but I was just giving an example of something. It was something that in class what we did, and, and it came up again a couple weeks later, and so he he listened to what only, you know, one of the students said and, and gave an option because of what she said. So he would he would read them and follow up immediately. It's just that that case you know, it wouldn't happen until the next uh, synchronous class meeting. I think it's a good idea. I'm having issues with my people, say my students and their undergraduates right now, but they are taking so many classes that I don't, I don't know, I'm having a hard time doing anything but what I think is most important that I do think is as important, but I'm the logistics of it right now are overwhelming me. Yeah, the one thing that you could do if you, I mean, just just a thought, I don't know if this would work, but if you were worried about the student's time, and, and this really isn't much, the students write a very brief response, but um, is, is to, you know, actually let them out 15 minutes early for them to, to do it right then. So I, I do think that is, interestingly enough, that's what the student said in, in her class review was she found it difficult to apply it right away. She basically said in her, it was her learning style that she needed to mull things over a little bit and do a few things before she could she could sit down and start doing it, which I totally understand, and that's why he, um, you know, he changed because of that. So, so maybe having them write this class review immediately after class isn't going to be good for all students. But, um, but anyway, that that could be. That's a, just a thought. So the um, I, I told you the midterm course evaluation. Actually, what I learned was to do it every five weeks. We have 15 week semesters, so I always tried to um, do it at the five week mark and at the 10 week mark. But I, looking back, I see that the questions I asked were, were almost like leading questions. You know, kind of like a Likert scale, like the course materials are effective, blah blah blah. I mean, it just really didn't give me a lot of great information unless something was blatantly wrong, whereas I think some open-ended questions um, would have been better. Um, and I have never done it in dialogue or discussion. 
Um, or maybe I have, but that's obviously going to take a, a little different tactic. So I'm primarily thinking here about written responses. Um, and then just I'll mention one other thing. This is also something Dr. Who does. It's more academic, I suppose, but um, he does a pre-reflection because the course is on a topic of technology, which people, and certainly our students, come with a preconceived notion such as either I love technology or I hate technology or technology shouldn't be in education or whatever it might be. Um, in a class where there might be that preconceived notion, um, this is particularly useful, I think. But basically, you just ask them to write an essay the first week of class to describe their perspective and attitude towards the topic. Um, and as I said, this topic was, was educational technology. So um, that's the, um, the kind of thing that might help you understand, you know, what you're getting you know, in this group of students and how you might do things by reading, being able to get an idea of, um, like I said, in this case, that, you know, half the class is anti-technology or something like that. <laughs> so, and then, of course, he has them do the same thing, their, their um, perspective on the topic at the very end. So it's a little different maybe than some of these others. So what other um, comments do you get, guys have, either on these or maybe just a different way to get some feedback from students. Well, I guess a, a little bit. I mean, it's very low, low <laughs> tech. It's just when you give the little, give me a check, give me a happy face, thumbs up, thumbs down, right during the class, um, I try to keep up with, with what their response is, which gives me feedback, are we OK? Yeah, Sue, so David was in the last session um, that I also attended, and we talked about that a little bit as well. Yeah, and that and, and that equates to clickers in a face-to-face -face class, which is that immediate feedback to kind of see, is everybody paying attention? Is everybody on the same page? Is everybody ready? Um, does everybody understand that and ready to go on the next thing or whatever? So, yeah, that's definitely a good idea. Any other thoughts? And just, I mean, I don't really feel like I've been doing anything like this, and that's why I want to get into doing something like this. Uh, and I don't know, I might even use both, because I've, I've never really thought about doing something after every class. Um, in some ways, that seems a little excessive, but it might work well for me to have some kind of a question. Like you said, I would want it to be open-ended, but maybe something effective what did you think you were supposed to learn out of this class, and what do you feel you did learn? Um, and maybe, you know, any ways in which they felt that could be improved. But then also I might like something that's a little not quite so often, that's more general about how the class is overall run, like things that they like or don't like, um, or that might be helpful changes. Yeah, so I just switched to this slide because that's kind of the question is what, what do you ask? Um, and as I told you, my, I think that open-ended gives you some better information um, maybe that you didn't expect. So here are some ideas, and um, this is kind of, I think, what you were saying, David. So um, one of the things that I mentioned in the last session, Sue, where, and David already heard this, is we had a faculty member um, who who asked about this? This was actually her question, or one of her questions. The same person that that um, took took this information, and instead of just reading it herself, she actually uh, reformatted it and put it all together, all the qualitative feedback in in an anonymous document, and immediately the next week shared it with the students. Um, but this was her main question that she, that you know all about, Sue, because you worked with her. <laughs> and so this is um, kind of a different sort of thing, getting at the delivery, so related to the session we attended last time, which was about delivery. So that's a question. And then the other thing um, 
that I think that maybe you talked about, David, is down here. What's going well, what's not. And um, have you guys heard of this? I um, just recently learned about this stop, start, continue framework. Have you heard of that? Nope. I don't think I have. Okay, I just pasted a link into chat. Um, this is, again, very similar to what we've already been talking about, but it's just put in a kind of a nice way. Um, so you're asking the students what you should start doing, what you should stop doing, and what you should continue doing. And I just kind of like that framework. Um, and what's interesting is the article that I just um, shared with you on chat points out that you would want to discuss the feedback to students, so not necessarily giving them their exact answers, but possibly, um, but, you know, pointing out to them that while what might be good for one student is not good for, for all the students and you might get conflicting requests um, to stop doing something or start doing the same thing, um, and also there are some things you're you're willing to change some things that you just, you are not willing to change um, for, you know, based on your experience or, or your approach or your course outcomes or whatever it may be. So um, this also, this website gives a, it, I'm going to take a little screenshot of it here, but it, it gives just an example. Just um, I thought this was kind of a useful example. I'm going to copy this here to the whiteboard for you to look at. Um, so this is a little table that they posted on this website basically an example of some of the students said to start doing the things in the first column, and then the students said stop doing the things in the second column, and then they said continue doing the things in the third column. So again, you're going to see some conflicting answers here, and, um, and that's why in this case they suggest discussing the results with the students so that, um, you know, you can't always please everybody, right? What do you think about start, stop, continue? That, that's very interesting. And so this was a one-time thing or, or just a, and you know, these questions kind of look like what we did during that with that Qualtics um, Trex survey when we were doing the research stuff. Um, Looks very familiar, and we did that every every time because we were collecting the d data. But uh, for this one, did they just do it once in a while? Um, this particular website, yeah, says um, recommends doing it at mid semester. So, and didn't you, Sue? Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you find that um, it was uh, the students didn't really like to give the feedback every single class, every week? Um, it was a quick survey and they did have class time to do it and I can't remember. Um, I think we did talk about that we didn't need to do it every time because we kind of got such a, a consistent, if we did it over that, I think we talked about that we would only do it, you know, several times because it, we didn't find new stuff every week, but um, doing it more episodic. Right, and, and um, that's a good point. It all depends on what you're asking, because if you are asking when you are most engaged, I could see where you would, you know, be less likely to need to do that every time, whereas if you're asking, um, you know, about something they learned, like Doctor Who is, and something that um, they're confused about, then that would be something that might be more suitable to asking every week. So I guess it does kind of depend on on what you're asking, but um, but I think you know the main question is basically what what most people are are trying to find out, which is what makes it formative, <laughs> is that what techniques made it easier for the students to learn. So um, that's really kind of what um, most people are trying to get at, so they can find out what what's working. Any other comments on what to ask? 
I think it's a good process, and and really thinking about those um, questions is good too. And depending on what the size of your class, and it showed up here too. You know that some people like more emails, some people don't like emails, but it does give you a general feeling. Right. Thank you. So. Uh, you mentioned, Sue, that you used Qualtrics, and David, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it is a UAA tool. Have you used Qualtrics before? I have not. Well, you're in for a treat. It's really a, quite a fabulous tool that UAA purchased for everybody's use. If you go to the UAA website and just type survey, search for survey, it'll come up, and you log into Qualtrics um, with your regular, the same way you log into Blackboard, and so we use it in the College of Ed for all kinds of different things, and it's it's a it's such an intuitive tool, and you can get your results in a, in a variety of formats. Um, and you know, most of the time, I'm the one on the designing end, just because that's my um, my forte. But basically, um, Sue could probably tell you more about the data and what to do with you know all the options for recording and putting the data into Excel to be able to manipulate it further. But but basically the cool thing is that you can um, collaborate with other people. So you just add other UAA folks as collaborator, collaborators and you can work together on the survey kind of like Google Docs and you can both see the results and um, you can just get a link and just put in Blackboard or however you want to do it by email um, the link and then everybody clicks on it. It's very similar to SurveyMonkey but it's all through UAA and it's, so it's free. Um, and so that works really well um, for certain things. Um, I do want to mention that um, a Google form in comparison, you know, we, we all actually do have access to Google too at UAA and um, a Google form just automatically gets plopped into a Google sheet, a, a spreadsheet. Um, it's really very simple. Um, Culture survey can be much more complicated, even though it's not hard to do. But you can have skip logic and all that kind of stuff. Like if they answered yes, you know, then you're going to ask them why or whatever. Um, but I will report that Doctor Who has chosen uh, primarily. He he just does it very simply. In the class review, he does in a in a regular old Blackboard assignment. So he just. Um, Ask them every week. He puts an assignment in called class review week one, class review week two, and um, same questions every time. And the students just go into Blackboard and put the assignment there. And um, you know, a journal would be um, another way. Maybe if I were doing, I'd probably use a journal just because it's a little easier to grade. Um, and then you would see all of their entries in the same place um, rather than in, in multiple places. Um, the grading of it would be maybe not as slick with a journal because it would be like, you know, you could give them five points each week and you just have to do five, ten, fifteen, or whatever. Um, but there's also a built-in survey tool inside Blackboard, which is exactly like the test tool, except if you choose survey instead of test, it's it's anonymous. So it's um, it's not really that anonymous if you have a small class, <laughs> but um, basically you just, when you're in your Blackboard gradebook, when you click at the top of the column, you get um, the option to see all of the um, the statistics. So 50% of the people said this or whatever. So it's, it's really very, very basic. But these are some thoughts uh, of some tools you could use when you are when you have chosen to do written feedback. Um, and Sue mentioned Qualtrics survey. Um, what other thoughts do you guys have or ideas did you have for, for how that, what tools do you use? I guess that's usually why I'm here, Katie. And David, uh, since Katie's just down the office from, or down the hallway from me, she is shoulder to shoulder with me on all this stuff. If it sounds like I know what um, I am doing independently, it is so helpful. So if you try any of these, Katie has just been wonderful about walking through and helping you um, kind of make it how it it's supposed to be in interpreting. It's really helpful. 
She seemed pretty nice when she was over here. That's what I'll say. I know it's been a long time. And and but David has Lee. Um, and Sue, you know Lee because Lee used to be here many years ago, and now we've switched places. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I'm sorry. I missed the very last part of what you said because I was answering my phone to see what the front desk was calling me about. <laughs> I got back on; it was quiet. I'm like, "Oh, great! Did you ask a question?" No, I was just telling Sue that you have you have Lee um, down the hall from you. So the Google form you like the Qualtrics. Qualtrics, but you said the Google form could put things into like a spreadsheet for you. Yeah, it the Google Form is just super slick. You and and really easy. If you want to just ask some basic information, it just it's nice because it just automatically goes into a Google spreadsheet. You just create the form and um and then there, it gives you a link, kind of like Qualtrics, and you give people that link, and then all you do is go back in and and view the results, and it shows it into a spreadsheet. Now with Qualtrics, you can also put it into a into a spreadsheet, um, it it has it's just so much more um, robust that it has tons of options. That is one of them, which actually took me a while to find. It, it's called if you use Qualtrics, it's called Download Data. So Download Data is what you want in Qualtrics to put it into a spreadsheet. Whereas there's a, a million other ways to create reports. And um, so Sue, let me ask you because you probably have more experience creating reports in Qualtrics. Um, you found, I'm sure, that it pretty much does whatever you want to do with the data? Yes, and because it was a research and then ran into, you know, a, uh, an artic a journal article, we did it several different ways, but it was it was easy to use. I mean, it, and it seems like a long time ago, but um, we got it in several different ways, and then it did a lot of the data um, analysis also for what we were doing, and so it was very usable. Yeah, so the uh, the Google form, there are some templates um, that you can start with, but it really isn't necessary. When you're doing a small survey like this, it's it's just so intuitive um, to just add a couple of questions to a Google form, and um, it's and you probably have seen seen a lot of people use them, and that's why it's just because it's so simple. Um, so the other the next thing. Which is really, um, I guess, the the last thing <laughs> is that you do uh, obviously hope to change your behavior and apply some of the the things that you learn by going through this um, activity of asking students for feedback, and so um, I was talking with one of my colleagues here, and she recommended that I share with you a model that they use um, here. Actually, when, when Lee worked here in the College of Ed, they, um, they, had, a, they had a grant, and they used um, a model, which I'm going to paste right here into chat, um, which was um, basically about, it's a framework for thinking about, about Different kinds of learning, um, and and so it stands for knowledge, attitude, skills, aspirations, and behavior. Um, I don't know how you pronounce it. Kasab, are you are either of you familiar with this framework? Not I. Not me. So basically. Um, it identifies the different kinds of changes that occur after you after you learn something new or some kind of intervention. Um, you, you have a change in knowledge, a change in attitude, a change in skills, um, and aspirations. But of course, in the end, the whole purpose was to improve or enhance your teaching, and so this is supposed to result in a in a behavior change. Um, so anyway, I just share that framework as a as a way to to think about it, um, about what to do. You know, so you've gathered this information, and um, 
I, I told you how Doctor Who handles it um, as far as the classroom review, but um, and also talked about how the start stop continue model tells you to discuss that with students so they understand um, there are some things you're you know you're willing to change, some things you're not, and some things that um, won't help everybody and and therefore are conflicting. So um, so when you guys did all this research. Um, do you want to say anything about what you did as a result of that information? <laughs> I can say this was a couple years ago. But, um, well, we really did talk about, you know, tra making changes and what we would do. And then we did have a peer-reviewed article in a journal, and it's, uh, it was good. And we laughed at some of the results, though, because like the engagement, we kind of um, found that people were engaged when they were talking, themselves presenting. I mean, they were most engaged, and any kind of big class that they had to wait, they were felt like they weren't mostly engaged. So, breakout rooms were very positive. Um, uh, being prepared on the instructor end was positive. So, I think it validated some things, and it really did point to some things that I think all three of us um, consciously have built in. Uh, Courses since then is that the kind of thing you make? I don't. It, I guess again it goes back to the intentional. It was a semester long, <clears throat> and then of course it took the year to get through the whole process. But that was intentional examining our teaching, and then we all agreed that the the best thing was that the three of us got together regularly and really talked about our teaching approach and what was working and what wasn't. And then we all decided that that's what's missing in many of um, um, our interactions with colleagues is we never have time to really intentionally examine what we're doing. And so I think probably we learned more from for ourselves than worrying about whether the people got more aspirations. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm sure that's true, and that fits so so well into the previous two presentations today, uh, which were all about peer uh, evaluation. So, or, or peer, not all, not only evaluation, but anyway, peer coaching, I guess, is the right word. <laughs> One of the things, and I don't know if in your department, David, it's happening at all, but. I'm just a little frustrated that our students seem to be taking so many classes, and I know this term millennials is coming into some of their attitudes and behaviors, but you know, it really seems like um, I have to go to just like points on everything. I mean, it just seems like they don't have time, they don't want to take time. If it isn't something they have to do, um, it's, it's that kind of thing which it's I don't need to know exactly what, not really aspirations, but something about how they're trying to get so much done in their own life and they have so many other things in their lives. I'm trying to work with um, some of this. Maybe initiative is, um, I, I'm not sure what it is, but that's the part that, that concerns me a lot. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, some of my students do sometimes try to do too much, and I just warn them about it. I don't. I mean, sometimes some of them take the advice, and later on they tell me how happy they are that they they dropped whatever, or, and other ones don't, and they're like, "Yeah, I should have listened to you," because um, they think they can do it, and it's just like, "Well, you know, you're in for a really rough ride. You might be able to do it, but this is what you're up against." Yeah, really, probably through that some feedback we, we should give to our student services office, and um, that would be good for them to know because it's going to affect the quality of what they're, they're getting out of it. Um, and, and maybe a change in, in some of our programming could alleviate that a little bit. Well, um, so in that, those are the big, oh, go ahead. It just makes me think that the importance of what you're talking about today and we're talking is to really get good at figuring out what is the the most efficient way of getting this information so that we can immediately 
um, make small changes that does improve their want to be there without putting a lot of just surveys and stuff. That's what's coming to mind to me. Yes, you're exactly right. Um, and that's something that I know has come up in some of the other organizations or within this organization, but some of the committees that I'm on um, is a little fear of over surveying <laughs> people. Um, you know, we've got the library survey right now and we have the student technology survey and we've got all these different surveys. So we, yeah, that's a good thing to, to consider. And if, if there's a way to, um, to get that out in an in an in class discussion or something along those lines, then it might be better use of everybody's of everybody's time, possibly. Okay, any other no. comments? Go ahead, David. Oh, I was just gonna say I think that is definitely a key part of it. I mean if you're gonna be doing these surveys like I mean I am thinking about well maybe I for at least to start with want to do some of these surveys weekly or whatever to find out or you know are students really getting out of a particular lectures what I'm intending them to get out and how could I change that so they can? Because it's really important for me to know. I can't really know it without surveying them and doing other assessment type work. Um, but I mean, I think doing the surveys is a real good way to get it quickly and to get something where they can tell me their opinion of why they're not getting it or whatever, as opposed to me just saying, well, well, their test results aren't what they should be, but that doesn't necessarily tell me why they're not getting it. Um, but I think letting them know and giving feedback to them from their feedback, you know, hey, I looked over all this, this is something, so I'm going to change this. Or, you know, people brought up this as a concern, but this is why we're teaching it this way and why it won't be changing. Like I can tell you with one of our class uh, sets of classes, they're very compressed and there will be people who will say, you should be teaching them over the entire semester. But we have reasons why we're teaching them the way we are. And I tell people that when I talk to them individually. Um, but if they, I think one of the key things is if they see you're using what they're providing to make changes to the class and they feel you're really doing it because you care about their learning and that, it's not going to be the same as uh, getting, you know, like you said, because otherwise they get over and then it un inundated with surveys and that, but a lot of times it's, well, people wonder, are they really going to change anything based off of this as part of it with it? Thank you for those excellent concluding remarks because that's that's really what it's all about. Um, so um, thank you for concluding for us and we basically um, have an evaluation which if you're planning to attend multiple sessions, you, you only have to fill this out, you know, at the end of the week if you'd like, but um, you can also um, fill it out for right after each session if you're one of those people that wants to <laughs> give that feedback immediately while it's fresh in your mind. Um, here's the link. And um, we do have an opportunity to earn some digital badges for participation. And um, so that's something new we're doing this year as a, as a little um, incentive. But a lot of our um, tenure track faculty in particular are looking for evidence that they have done some professional development. And this is um, one way to um, have some evidence of that. So that's all we have. So thank you guys for joining me and participating actively. I was going to ask with the, the uh, digital badges and stuff, is that the way